How would you deal with criminals in the wake of a societal collapse event that entailed the breakdown of law and order? Let's talk about it. Now, before I get into this video, I just want to say that this is not advice. Never do anything that is against the law. Always consult with your local authorities before attempting anything in this video. Now, in the off chance of a grid down event in which local law enforcement is no longer operational or available, you are 100% responsible and accountable for any strategy you employ to deal with people who you perceive to be breaking the law. This video is proposing options which are more in line with the existing rule of law than the Wild West approach touted by most preppers. I cannot guarantee that this will be the safest or most appropriate approach for your situation and your circumstances. The sole purpose of this video is to simply provide ideas for how to manage these situations so you have one more tool in your toolbox. I'm also really hoping that anybody who works in law enforcement or corrections will weigh in on this conversation in the comment section below. I always learn things from my viewers and I welcome any critical feedback. Now let's get to it. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So, what do you think? Does it suit me? If you said yes, wrong answer. If you haven't seen my five part series with Marcus over at Fresh Out, go check that out. I'll post the link in the description below. Now I really hope this garb isn't foreshadowing. I always abide by the law, I mind my own business, but I do have a channel called Canadian Prepper and the way things are going with society nowadays, they may just lock me up for the hell of it. Anyways, let's hope not. So I wanted to talk a bit today about what do you do with troublemakers after disaster strikes. Not every situation is gonna be such that you can use a lethal force, especially in the early phases of a post-disaster environment for three reasons. Number one is gonna be your conscience. Nobody wants that on their conscience. Anybody who I've talked to who has had to take the life of somebody else, either in combat or in the line of duty, you know, they're traumatized by it and it's not something that they revel in or they found was easy. Next is gonna be the legal ramifications. This really is gonna depend on where you live because if you live in a place where there is a castle doctrine and where the courts typically side with the victim, then you're probably gonna be all right uh, depending on what the, the circumstances were of the altercation. But depending on the magnitude and the longevity of the disaster, in most instances, it's going to be a regional thing, which is going to be cleared up, you know, within a month or two. Uh, if it is a longer term situation, then obviously you may have to take more extreme measures to protect yourself and your community. But for the most part, to avoid incrimination and to avoid it coming back to you when the lights come back on, you know, you may want to at least weigh your options with how you deal with people. And the third thing is, is going to be revenge from that individual's friends and family. If you lock somebody up, at least then you have a bargaining tool. You have choices. You know, you have the opportunity to deal with the issue democratically within your community. Now there's gonna be those life or death circumstances where you're not able to put someone away. Not every situation is going to be a potentially fatal situation for you. It might be a person who is caught stealing it may be somebody who has done something in the past and you just found out about it and now you want to bring that person to justice somehow in whichever way, shape or form you can because obviously you're not going to have a lot of resources and time and energy to deal with these people in a way which is less than lethal. But once again, the law, your conscience and revenge are all things you have to worry about because that individual is going to have family members they're going to be looking for them. They're going to have friends, acquaintances, and chances are they're going to have some idea of where they were last seen. So it's going to come back to you ultimately in some way, shape or form. People will do their investigating and it will come back to you. At least if you have a person incarcerated, then you have more options. Now, like I said, you're not going to be able to use this for everybody, but I've always thought about how would you go about locking somebody up? because you don't want to just put them in a room because you know a door is not going to stop somebody you don't want to keep them handcuffed to you know something all the time and people can get out of handcuffs also it's not that hard 
if they have uh, a few little tools. And so how do you do it? How do you lock them up? Well, I think this is a really good solution, a shipping container, because you can't get out of here. I mean, once you lock these doors, uh, there's no getting out of here. And you could easily put several prisoners in there if you had to. Now, I just want to add in here so there's no confusion. The only reason why you would ever want to do something like this is in the off chance that your local law enforcement was not functional. Perhaps they were just completely overwhelmed and your municipality and the facilities that would normally act as holding cells were non-operational. This would obviously be something which would require community involvement and the time, energy and resources it's going to take to maintain it. It's probably as likely that there'll be local holding cell facilities which will be commandeered by whoever is making the rules post SHDF and that they will be used for this purpose. And I must emphasize that in doing something like this, you are doing so at your own risk. I do not advocate doing this necessarily. This is an idea for you to consider in the rare event that this sort of strategy would be applicable. You are responsible for all of the legal implications and for all of the safety implications of doing something like this. And for legal reasons, I have to say this last part, please don't be stupid and do this while the rule of law is still in operation. If you have somebody in your custody who's broken a law, the first thing you should do is contact your local authorities. Now in terms of the operational security component, coming in and out of the door, you'd have to set up a system in which the prisoner went to the opposite end of a container as you open the door. If you were going to be putting, you know, food or if you're dealing with septic issues, you could possibly even uh, put a toilet in there for them as well. So, you know, I know a lot of people are just going to be all John Rambo and say, well, I would never invest the time and energy to do that. But it's just one of those things. Uh, if you want civilization to make a return, which you should, even if it's on a small scale, you're going to need a holding cell, whether it's for people who are just drunk and intoxicated and causing a ruckus or people who are stealing or partaking in mischievous acts, or maybe you're not sure if a person committed a crime and you just need to hold them while you do some kind of investigation. You know, having a shipping container is a very good use for that. Now, I'm not saying everybody should run out and necessarily get a shipping container. I'm just saying, if you do find yourself in one of these situations, these things are a dime a dozen nowadays. They're everywhere. They're, they're all over the place. Now, transporting it post grid down is obviously going to be an issue. You're going to need a flatbed truck to do that. So if you don't have it in your immediate vicinity before that, uh, it might be difficult for you to do that afterwards. They range from about $1,000 to $5,000 depending on the size. But in terms of the general uses of a shipping container, I mean, these things are built so tough. I mean, right now, I think this one weighs 4,760 pounds. Uh, max carrying capacity is 67,000 pounds. So it's just a big chunk of steel. You can do a lot with this. Now, Rod Giltaka from Civil Advantage did a test to see whether or not a firearms round would pierce through it. And unfortunately it did. So it's not gonna provide you a lot of cover in that regard, unless you're using sandbags or something like that. But in terms of, you know, a better than nothing uh, shelter, in the case of a weather disaster, or even just to store your excess uh, preparedness supplies. These ones come with four locks on them, and there's also a lock under here, and there's special locks that you can get uh, to prevent bolt cutters, uh, anti-pick locks with the four star uh, locking system, or just uh, some sort of combination lock, so that you could, you know, if you wanted to put four locks on it, just as, you know, extra safety. Now, if you wanted to go one step further, of course, you could bury it, but you know that comes with a lot of issues as well. If you're talking about flooding and mold and rust and stuff like that. According to Ron Hubbard, yes, I said that right, Ron Hubbard at Atlas Survival Shelters, uh, the corrugated round pipe is the best for building underground shelters. It's the most solid that you can get and the least problematic when it comes to flooding and mold and mildew and all that stuff. So I'll uh, post another link to uh, my interview with him. It's a two part series in the description below. Now, because you don't know what's going on inside, you may have to have some sort of surveillance camera in there. 
to make sure that you know where the prisoner is before you open the door, uh, to make sure you know that they're at the back, or what you could do is you could cut some kind of slot into this so that you could serve them food through there or whatever you have to do. So I'm sure there's quite a few different workarounds there in that regard. But if you have the fantasy that you're just gonna be putting people down left and right without consequence, without legal recourse, and without your conscience coming back to bite you, then I think you got another thing coming. The more literature I read about uh, real disasters that have happened and even fictional works, you know, which attempt to paint a picture of what things would be like, uh, the more clarity I get about what a situation like this would actually look like. Like for instance, if there was an EMP and there was a power outage, it's not gonna be sudden chaos right away. You know, it, it's gonna be a gradual decline. And throughout that gradual decline, there will be some measure of law and order. And there is gonna be a period where there will be consequences for your actions. Now, if you're just minding your own business and you're bunkering in, in your domain and you're not playing an active role in the communal rebuilding process then perhaps you have more leverage there in terms of dealing with trespassers in whichever way you choose but if you're out and about and you're in the mix and you're actually trying to help rebuild your community and you're trying to help other people out you may find yourself in a situation where you have to arbitrate what happens to somebody and in that case Think about this because it may be an option. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com. We've totally revised our website. We only deal with quality products at the best prices and all of my subscribers get a VIP discount of 10% off the entire store. Use discount code SURVIVALPREPPER for 10% off. Don't forget the strong survive and the prepared thrive. See you next time.